So here's what we're going to do. This is going to be our example, and then I'm going to set you to work the exercise already there in Canvas. We've just looked at how similar the dot product in 3D is to the dot product in 2D. If you use this formula, it's identical, right? But there are things you can do in three dimensions that you can't do in two dimensions. Read this question with me, 11. Find a vector that's perpendicular to both. Uh, oh, there's my screen recording. <laughs> uh, I minus j plus 2k and 2i plus j minus 3k. There's the question. Seems simple enough, right? Someone tell me why this has to be a 3D question, not just because it's i's, j's, k's. Why is there no equivalent question in 2D? Any takers? Read the wording of the question. Think about this. What are you thinking, Brent? Um, you can't, in 2D, you can't find the vector that is perpendicular to both two vectors that are not parallel. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let me just say that again, see if I got you right, Vren. In two dimensions, if you have any two arbitrary vectors that aren't parallel, because obviously if they are parallel, what's the point? Like something perpendicular to one will be perpendicular to the other. If you have two non-parallel vectors, right, then if someone says to you, find something perpendicular to both of them, you can't do it, right? You can per be perpendicular to one of them. Uh, let's put it over here. That's perpendicular to one, but not the other, right? Here's another one. It's perpendicular to this one, but clearly not to the other one. In 2D, you're either perpendicular to this one or you're perpendicular to that one. But in 3D, you can be perpendicular to both. How can we use the dot product? How does the dot product help us with this? Think back right to the start of the lesson. To be orthogonal and perpendicular, we would say? Yeah, dot product of zero, right? So what we want to do is set up some arbitrary vector. So if we've got, uh, what are the numbers here again? Uh, you've got 1, negative 1, 2. 1, negative 1, 2. What's the other one? 2, 1, minus 3. 2, 1, and negative 3. Thank you very much. So here's our two vectors that we're starting with. There's some other vector, x, y, z, right? And if we compute dot product for these, it should be zero. If we compute dot product for these, it should also be zero. Now, I want you to start. Set that up. It's not entirely straightforward because once you do those two, some questions still remain. I want to see if you can push through them together and by yourselves. I'll show you the answer shortly, but can you start by at least working out those two dot products and then thinking about what will you do with those dot products to work out our third vector? Give it a go. I'm going to give you a few minutes to have a play on your own. So, whoopsie daisy, my XZ plane. Um, what have we got here? I haven't helped you out very much, but hopefully you got these two equations. Where do these two equations come from? Not a rhetorical question. Dot product. Yeah, these are two dot products, right? And I'm saying they're both equal to zero. You can see, in fact, in my working, right? We've said this a lot. We said it a heck of a lot in proof, but it's always true, right? Um, clarity over brevity. A lot of you just went straight to these two equations. I would really like you to tell me where those equations came from. So you can see my little preamble up the top there. Okay. Now I then add these two equations and then everything comes to a screeching halt. right? Because you're like, wait a second, I've got two unknowns. Sorry, I've got three unknowns and only two equations to solve them with, right? which is usually kind of a problem. Now, I'm going to try and tease out for you why it isn't a problem. In fact, it has to be this way, that you've only got two equations to try and solve for three unknowns, by bringing you back to the wording of the question. Just come and have a look back with me. I had this brief conversation with some of you, but not most of you. The question doesn't say, find the vector that's perpendicular to, to these two other ones. It doesn't say find the vector, because the vector would imply that there is only one. Right? But in fact, there isn't just one vector that's perpendicular to both of those. There is, there are infinitely many, in fact. We can find all of them in a way. Okay? So therefore, that's why we don't get a third equation, because that would uniquely define there's a single x, a single y, a single z. There isn't a single x, y, and z. Right? That's why we have this kind of unexpected freedom in solving the question. So here's what we have to do. We actually need to select a value that will help us to you know, eliminate you know, the three unknowns. So this is going to sound really weird, but I'm just going to say let x equal 1. I'm just going to consider a convenient value, right? Now, you might think x equals 1. I mean, it's not complicated, but why not choose something even simpler like x equals 0? Like x equals 0 will make things even easier to solve, wouldn't it? 
I'm going to let you think for the next three or four minutes in the background while I go and see the implications of this, why I haven't chosen and why in fact real bad idea to choose let x equal zero. We'll return back to that you after you've had some thinking time. Let's see what happens when I try this value. I'm going to get 1 minus y plus 2z equals 0 and 2 plus y minus 3z also equals 0. Is that all right? I'm going to call this 1a so I remember where it came from and I'm going to call this 2a so I remember where it came from. Now what are you going to do with them? Add them together. That's, that seems like a fairly reasonable thing to do. When you add them, your y's cancel, right? So when I do 1a plus 2a, I'm going to get the y's are gone. I'm going to get 3. What else on the left hand side? No more y's? Minus z. That equals 0. So I clearly get a value for z. And then hopefully it doesn't take you too long to substitute back in. You get a value for y, namely, who's already got it? It's 7, right? If you, if you go ahead and you put z equals 3 into either of these, you should get dot 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 y equals 7. So what does this tell us? This tells us that one of the vectors that's perpendicular to these two should be the vector. Uh, let's have a look. Make sure you get your order right because we didn't calculate their order in the order that they come. It's not 1, 3, 7. It's 1, 7, 3. Is that all right? Yeah. Now, if you didn't uh, take the prompt already, I'd love you to open up your device and pull open 3D GeoGebra. Just Google it if you can't remember. Oh, I need to unfreeze this. You've got, you've got your uh, 3D coordinate space set up. I didn't really show you this in detail before, but you can input, like 3D GeoGebra is built for this, right? You can input vectors very easily into 3D GeoGebra if you follow these instructions fairly closely. Um, you've got a proper keyboard there, so uh, mine sort of defaults there, but if you use lowercase and you say something like, say for example, u, and then you say equals, if I go back to my correct keyboard here, u equals, if you define your coordinates here, like say 1, negative 1, and 2, and you just put them in between brackets like you normally would with coordinates, once you put those in, comma, 2, um, you can see it just immediately gives you a vector. It's a bit hard to see because it's coming out into the first octant. Well, actually, it's not the first octant. I'll take it back. It's the second, I guess. I'm actually not sure what order it is as you go around. But there it is. There's the vector that we wanted. And once you click away, you can see it, go, it reverts into column form just to show you it knows it's a vector. So there's U. Uh, let's go ahead and put the next one in. I guess I'm going to call it V. Um, if, by the way, you put a capital, it'll give you a coordinate rather than a vector. So that's why it's important to be in lowercase. Uh, what did we say? It was 2, comma, 1, comma, negative 3. All right. Um, by the way, if you've set it to default, you can see this line is, or this vector rather, is dotted. And that's because it's hiding underneath our xz plane. Can you see that? So anything that's hidden behind a plane will go, will go dotted like that. So there it is. So here are our two original vectors. Okay. Now we're going to put in the vector that we found. What were, um, what were its components again? 173. One, so I'm going to call it <laughs> W because uh, I have the imagination of a gnat. So we're going to call it 1, 7, 3. And then suddenly it appears, but you're like, mm. in 2D it's not immediately clear that that is correct. So you need to, and this is why I'm asking you to have a play with it, you need to spin it around, right? So let's have a look at, say, the, the new vector and um, the first vector, which I've called u, right? If you get it at the right orientation, I'm going to spin it around this way. If you look at it with the right plane as your perspective, you're like, oh, bam, there's the right angle that I was hoping for. Can you see that? Uh, sort of coming down and then launching off. So there's 1, 7, 3 being perpendicular. How am I perpendicular to the other one? Because we established in two dimensions you can't be perpendicular to two vectors. Um, well, you just need to find the appropriate angle there it is, roughly, okay, that gives this new plane, this second plane, the right perspective. And you now can see the right angle between the second vector and our vector. Make sense? So that's how we know our answer is right. Why did I say uh, we shouldn't start with x equals 0? Why is that a bad idea? What happens if you let x equals 0? We run into this problem, right? You're like, oh, no problems. Like, I get really simple equations. I get uh, minus y plus 2z equals 0 here. And then I get y minus 3z equals 0. And I can try to solve this just like I did before, add these two equations to eliminate the y's. And then you're like, oh, 
minus z equals zero, so z zero. If z zero, then y is also zero. Uh oh. Well, I shouldn't have done it that way. This is the answer I've got. Now I want you to call your mind back. Think, 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 think. Back to extension one, right? This vector has a name. What's it called? The zero vector, because it's full of zeros, right? Do you remember us thinking about the fact that the zero vector, despite the fact it doesn't go anywhere, right? It actually has a relationship to every other vector out there, right? We said it was parallel to every other vector, like these guys, right? But weirdly, and it's very strange, right? If it's parallel to every other vector, that also means it's perpendicular to every other vector. Vector. Does that make sense? The dot product just shows you, right? We know, going back to the 2D dot product, if you compare any vector and the zero vector, you'll get a dot product of zero. That means perpendicular, question mark, right? So this is not a helpful answer. We would call this, mathematicians would call this, the trivial case. True, but completely unhelpful, right? So that's why starting at some other value will help. What happens if you uh, put in something bigger? Like say, x equals two. If you go ahead and you crunch them, I can tell you right now, you're going to get 2, 14, 6. You're going to get a different scalar multiple of this guy, right? If you put in x equals negative 1, it's going to be the same vector but facing in the opposite direction. You'll get negative 1, negative 7, negative 3. Still perpendicular because they're on the same line that stretches out forever. Does that make sense?